Welcome to the Beyond Body podcast with your hosts, Mia and Holly. Join us for a sometimes fortnightly podcast where we explore all things mental health, being a messy human and how to get the most out of this one precious life and all the ridiculous stories in between. Happy 2024. Welcome back. It is, as always, amazing to see you, but brilliant to kick off the year with you. It's so nice to be back. 2024 feels like it's going to be a good year. What have you been up to so far? Look, so far, not much. (laughs) (laughs) Tons to report. I've honestly got nothing to report. I feel like at the end of the work year, I had one of those breaks where it was really just rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. I did go back. I did go up to the Northern Rivers for a little while and we had a flash flood. My gorgeous friends have just bought this new house out in Mwilumba, 24 hours of rain huge amount of water we were out on paddle boards going to the washing line to get the like the close off the line so that was a little bit exciting um but other than that four days back into work loving it it feels yeah. nice um coming off the holiday being like that was great but I also really enjoy my normal life <laughs> I couldn't agree with you more the last episode that we did I was talking about how I was like on a speed run to Lord Howe and how I was so looking forward to the break And I was like, I needed the downtime and particularly like time away from screens, which that's the perfect place to do that. But throughout the entire break, I was at no point thinking, I just don't want to go back or, you know, I could do with a few more days where usually it doesn't matter how much time you book over there. Usually by the end, you're like, oh, just one or two more days. I just didn't feel that, which I think I mentioned this when I came back from America. It's a nice thing to go through periods where you don't want to run away from your own life (laughs) or constantly be on holiday from it. Uh, So what are we talking about today, Hol? I'm excited for this conversation. I think it's going to be hopefully have a lot of value to a lot of people, but we're talking about this idea of busy work in a recovery sense and just kind of unpacking what it is, but then also comparing that to the real healing work and what are some of the differences here and what are some of the things that we can look out for if someone is doing one, not the other, and sort of what what actually happens when you lean more so into one or the other. Yes, absolutely. I really love this topic because it's getting into some very real conversations that we have to have. Yes, recovery is an amazing, often euphoric, transformative, incredible experience. But in order to access that, sometimes we have to get really honest with ourselves. And that's part of our job as well is to get really honest with people. Uh, Honesty without judgment, that is how we approach it. But you do sometimes have to hold up this mirror and be like, I know that's what we hope is going on, but there's not a lot of indicators that that is actually what is going on, right? Like the results aren't matching maybe the amount of uh, paddling that's happening under the surface, right? So if we define busy work in recovery, or if you could identify some of the signs of what points to the fact that recovery busy work is going on, what are some of the indicators that it's happening or like, how do you define it? Mm. I also just think to piggyback on what you just said that it is really like holding a mirror up to someone to to really witness some of the sticky, yucky things. I feel like maybe people even listening to this are going to be like, okay, strap in. Like, yeah. I feel like I'm about to be called out on some things. Yeah, yeah. I think busy work can look like a lot of different things, but mm-hmm. how I would describe it is that it's pretty much doing some of the ticking of the boxes work or the prep work or the beating around the bush work. It's sort of doing all the work that might make it look like on the surface, everything is moving along swimmingly. Mm. But by doing this, sometimes it's bypassing the inner work, which is the under the surface work, which is what we would call the real work. So think about busy work as um, it's like activities that keep you busy, but don't necessarily create a lot of value on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. It's, I I totally agree with all those definitions. It is definitely like talking the talk, but not then transitioning into walking the walk. It's a lot of stuff is happening. A lot of writing is happening. A lot of scrolling is happening. A lot of things look like they're going on, but as far as actual measurable change, nothing is actually shifting in a forward direction. Yes. I think a good way to think about it is that it's kind of like doing a driving theory test without actually making it to the road and being like, no, I know how to drive. I totally know. 
Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, similar to that, it's like, have, yeah, it's like having a vehicle or bike or something. And like, you spend all your time maintaining it. Like you polish it and like you even like replace parts for it, but no one ever gets on the bike. Yes, it's exactly, yeah. it's exactly like that. And I think this real work stuff that we'll get into, this is what actually helps you build a sturdy foundation. And as we know, anything that we want to be long lasting requires a sturdy foundation. So this conversation we're going to have today, it's really about parking the corner cutting, the avoiding of the sticky stuff and sometimes mm-hmm. the really painful stuff as well and really seeing the picture of what is actually necessary for you to reach this place of recovered. And, com- and coming from a place of compassion as well, where this is not just a call out for the sake of calling out, it's to bring your attention to why this might be happening. There's some very understandable reasons why this mm-hmm. can come up and it can come up for people who are sort of in that pre-contemplative stage of recovery, the very early stages of recovery, and it can even show up at various points throughout the recovery process, no matter where you're sitting across that spectrum, Mm. right? So this is by no means just for the sake of pointing out where this shows up. It is also to explore why it might be showing up as well. Totally. And I also think um, busy work shows up, can show up in life, recovery or not. So just understanding what it might look like and what are some of the signs will probably also help you in a non-recovery sense. I know it definitely has helped me because busy work was not a new phenomenon to me in recovery or just in life generally. Well, when I was thinking about this episode, I thought eating disorders are the definition of busy work. So it makes sense that we then transition that mentality or that approach to life or coping or uh, making change, we then apply that to other areas of life as well, because eating disorders are avoidant sets of behaviors, right? They're avoidant patterns, which means that we're not really moving forward. We're just stagnating and kind of keeping ourselves looking over here while all this mess is sitting over here. And we don't want to unpack this and look at this, but if I've got all my numbers and all my rules and all of my body focus, and if I'm changing my body and trying to get to outcomes this way, it doesn't really matter if I'm getting to the outcomes, as long as I'm avoiding the stuff that I don't really want to deal with. So busy work is something that if, you know, you've had an eating disorder, you're probably excellent at it. And it's probably your default. You may not even realize that some of the stuff that's transitioned from your eating disorder to your recovery is actually rooted in uh, how you operated within your eating disorder. And again, from that compassionate standpoint, explains why it might be the uh, way in which you're approaching your recovery. It's very normal to kind of bring those old patterns into recovery. Part of our job is to get people to see that and go, we're not doing that anymore. Yes, I think we've very much thought about this the same way. I think, so some examples of this could be um, things like booking appointments and either yes. not going but, or maybe you do go, but you don't necessarily follow through with any of the behavioral work suggested once that self-awareness piece is actually in place. Yes. It also could look like making heaps of lists about what needs to change and really being able to like talk the talk, like you were saying, but not actually working through the list or even a good one is not a good one. Another example. Mm-hmm. Actually, I mean, none of these are really, it's also important. I think for us to preface that these things aren't negative. Mm. They're just not that supportive on their own. Totally. And um, another big one would be like reading heaps of self-help books. I think mm. with this, you know, modern new age wellness, this is a really easy form of busy work that a lot of people fall into. Mm. So you could read all these self-help books, right? But then start maybe preaching about some concept like overcoming reactivity, but then still exploding at the drop of a hat when your online shopping order is wrong. Yeah. So it's like it's really like very much what you're saying, like, action speaks so much louder than words in every sense of life and particularly in the conversation about busy work because all of these things they actually will offer some type of temporary feeling of relief and they also will offer you this sense of yeah like a bit of accomplishment that feeling of yeah I'm doing the work and none of these things are negative right it is absolutely necessary to really understand and learn about your emotional world and be educated about Um, what's going on in your mind so you can really put together the pieces to gain awareness of what actually needs to shift in your life. But Mm -hmm. the busy work needs to be the precursor to the actual work of doing the harder thing because it has relevance. The busy work has relevance. Mm -hmm. But if you stop there, I think it's this huge disservice to yourself because it's kind of missing the point. If you're not using all of your new knowledge to inform 
positive behavioral change mm-hmm. that will actually help you take one step in the direction of your healing. We're kind of, we're missing the point a little bit. Completely. And as you say, it can be really essential as a piece of the pie chart, but it's not yeah. the whole pie chart. And it's, it's acknowledging that these things can be really helpful, but they're not fulsome. They're not going to do the whole job. Some of the other ones that I've identified that have come up a lot with clients are things like even like following recovery content, right? Following lots and lots and lots of recovery content, thousands of accounts, hundreds of accounts, whatever it might be, and kind of saturating yourself in recovery and, you know, recovery videos and podcasts and finding that inspiration and looking for, which again is so important, especially to see various stories and uh, all kinds of uh, incarnations of recovery. So important. That's not going to shift your recovery forward. Watching somebody else recover is not going to make you recover. Yes, it can show you what direction to head in, or it might even spark, like I said, motivation and inspiration. But unless you're taking action then yourself, that in and of itself is not going to make a difference, right? I hear people a lot um, from clients saying, you know, I've read the books and I've, you know, I follow recovery content and I'm, I know everything. I have all the theory and it's not changing anything. And it's really helping people to, take that step uh, beyond what they've learned about maybe uh, treatment, some of their treatment experiences where they talk a lot about their eating disorder and they talk a lot about their history and they're not given anything to actually work on. And then they come into coaching and the penny kind of drops for them about what this job is, because that's why our role was created in the first place is that that actual framework of taking steps and putting all that theory and putting all that self-awareness and putting all that self-knowledge into action uh, for a lot of people, they haven't been given that framework. Uh, So it can be a couple of things. It can be that they've just never been presented with a framework and an approach to actually implement change, but it can, I think, also be fear-based and a bit of that procrastination and telling ourselves where something's happening when it really isn't. Yeah, that was actually my experience that when I first went into recovery and saw a psychologist, like I learned so much about what was going on. I had no skills to do anything with the information. So it sort of was like, so the change is that I'm still doing everything I was doing, but now I just know what I'm doing. And I think that makes me feel worse. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that makes me not want to change it. And I just want to be more avoidant because this feels horrible. And I think the danger also is of like being a self-aware person is that you will start therapy or do some self-guided healing and you will get all the theory very easily. And you can be, you'll be able to be super academic about yourself in conversation, but all the talky talky is only going to get you so far. You yeah. really need to, be able to feel the change in your core. And yeah, it's really great to be able to see, you know, how your upbringing has influenced your decisions and how it continues to play a role in your interpersonal relationships and your relationship to food and self. But if we're not actioning anything differently, history actually will continue to play out in the present moment, except like, and this was my experience, except now it's repeating itself and I have the awareness and it feels really shit. Mm -hmm. So why is it important for us to make clients aware or for individuals to be aware that they're engaging in busy work? Like, what, What can the impact be? So simply, it's because this could be the reason that your recovery is stagnant. So this could actually be the reason that you may be standing in your own way without even realizing it. Mm -hmm. And exploring this stuff actually could be a bit of a lifeline. And I think this idea speaks to this bigger conversation about how an eating disorder influences how you show up in the world beyond the food relationship, which is sort of what you were talking about before, um, that we can sort of like have this approach to life that we are conditioned through the eating disorder. And then we try to take it into recovery. Mm -hmm. So I see when I was really thinking about this, I see busy work as very much being in the doing arena, right? And I see the real healing work as being in the being arena. So doing being external and being, this is quite the tongue twister, being, being (laughs) internal. And the internal work is so important because it is what will then positively inform the external work. Like Mm. obviously the real work is the external stuff, but we want it to come from this place of actually understanding why are you doing it? Mm. So I think, you know, you learn a hell of a lot when you enter recovery and 
a big piece of this is learning, well, kind of coming into the awareness that anything external, and this includes a material existence or a certain body type, cannot fundamentally heal your life, which opposes what the eating disorder would love for you to believe, which is that controlling your body and focusing on other people's opinions or status or an external reality will give me a really great life, right? Mm -hmm. But by putting all your eggs into the basket of external things, or even, and that can include even people in the hope that they will heal you and keep you safe. It's likely going to leave you feeling more lost and dissatisfied than you were at the beginning because it skips and it bypasses this crucial piece of work, which is looking inward and learning to rely on yourself. This is this inner work. It's a great reflection of why it's so important to get to the core of why we might do this, because that's going to benefit you not only for your recovery progress, but this is going to show up in your life so much. It's that external ticking of the boxes of identity and worth and value and feeling none of it because the inner work has not been done. The really hard stuff that you've got to get to, to be able to feel fulfillment and self-acceptance and true connection to self and therefore to others is not yeah. going to happen just because you you got this pay rise or you have this title on your business card or because you live in whatever postcode or you've got whatever latest car that you bought with, you know, your bonus that you got this year. None of that is actually going to shift or change any of the stories that you're telling yourself unless you're willing to go inside and, as we say often, sit in the shit uh, and <laughs> really sort through it. And I think... When I can identify a client engaging in a lot of busy work, the reason it concerns me is that I think it's one of the biggest contributors to recovery burnout because you are doing stuff, like you are engaged cognitively and you are expending your energy and you are putting your focus and time and even money and resources. It's why I'm so adamant with clients. If I do not believe that coaching is benefiting them, I will not take their money. I am not going to burn through their energy, their money, and their time if it's not the right time for them to be doing coaching, right? So they're going to be burning through all this energy and all this time and all this resourcing and nothing's going to change. And then what's really uncomfortable sometimes is that a client will come to me and I can see that for years they've been engaging in recovery, busy work. And I'm the first one to hold up the mirror and go, this is why you haven't gotten where you want to get to. This is why you can't see any clear metric Mm -hmm. metrics of progress. And it's truly the first time they realize it. And then they start to get a little bit burnt out. They're tired because they have actually been doing stuff, but it hasn't actually shifted their stage of recovery in any way. And then they realize, oh my gosh, now I really have to get in and do even more intense cognitive work, even more intense practical work. And I'm kind of burnt out already because I've been spinning my wheels around all this stuff that isn't actually moving me me forward. It's like, Mm -hmm. I hate that so many of my metaphors are movement-based. Please forgive me. I will try to come up with ones that have nothing to do with movement. It's like running on a treadmill. Lots of movement, lots of energy, lots of uh, action happening. Location's not different. You're still in the same room, in the same house, in the same suburb. You haven't gone anywhere, but you're exhausted. So being really aware of some of these indicators and some of the reasons why you're doing it is so important for even just for that reason alone. That's why I bring it up with clients. There's so many reasons, but that's always probably my chief concern is that at some point they're going to hit a wall and I have the lovely job of saying there's actually more that we have to do here and they're like are you for real I have been doing stuff and I'm tired and you're telling me that this isn't moving me forward in any way it can be a very hard realization for people to come to yeah I you're really speaking my language today (laughs) because so much as well particularly I'm, I'm working so hard I'm doing all these things and yes you could be really trying to log your food and you're reading all these books and you're doing a deep dive into learning all these things and you're going to all these new practitioners but if you're still looking at yourself in the mirror with hate and there's no awareness of the cognitive dissonance there okay we're, it's gonna be it's gonna be groundhog day like if we look at this from like just a wellness culture perspective like someone could be like yeah I'm really gonna change my life and I'm gonna like try this new workout thing and I'm gonna like eat healthy and I don't know, do some type of meditation. But if you were still fundamentally talking to yourself with hate and you were forcing yourself to do this, you were doing the external work and you were missing the point, Yeah. right? And I think kind of coming back to this conversation that when you are 
on a path of relying fundamentally on these external existence things to heal you, which that example would be, there has been no space for understanding who you are without all this stuff and Mm -hmm. who you are without all the roles you play in the world, right? And that's a problem. So this way of, this eating disorder way of living where we condition ourselves to seek out instead of looking within, it's not surprising at all that in recovery, the same thing is happening with an attempt to seek out, to find the answers, right? Which might look like this emphasis on a certain practitioner or this one book being the pot of gold you're seeking because this way problem solving through seeking out it's known and it's familiar right Mm -hmm. and of course as all humans will we're all going to always lean to the type of problem solving that seems like it's known and it's familiar and you also could have gotten really good at the busy work yes like someone who's really good at like planning and doing all these things so you're like this is this is easy for me yeah it's actually that difficult because this way of problem solving and seeking out the problem is that you don't get that information of knowing that you are and always have been the answer and you are the only one that can heal your life. And yes, it's important to have um, supports, both professional and personal. Yes. Um, And it's necessary to outsource information, of course, but again, only as a supportive measure so Mm. that those learnings can give you the necessary tools that you need so that you can actually practice and cultivate deep change. Could not agree more. I have, uh, it hasn't happened for a while, but particularly when I was first coaching, I would have people reach out to me and they would say things like, you know, I want you to make me recover. And I was like, that's not, I can't do that. (laughs) I can't do that. Because as you say, the supports are so important. The guidance can be so important. The frameworks and the map and someone giving you that, but you're not going to move anywhere on that map unless you put the next foot in front of you. Like I could, I can walk the map, but it doesn't make any difference to your recovery, what I'm doing, right? It's kind of like when I say to clients, like I, when they are sending me dialogues and they're not really having a nudge at being the healthy self, they want me to be the healthy self. And I'm like, if I'm your healthy self, these, these wires aren't going to change in your brain and mine have already changed. So this is like, it's not useful to me and it's not going to be useful to you because that discomfort that comes from making yourself push yourself at your growth edges and get into that gray space that's not yet familiar that is where the brain is forced to pay attention and start to build new stuff so we're not just talking about this from this sort of abstract uh aspect like this philosophical aspect it's because there is literally a physical change that happens when you force yourself into that space that feels so uncomfortable and that's where the action happens because this is what makes recovery so difficult at its core recovery is action led thought and feeling followed you have to take the action first action that feels unfamiliar that can feel scary that can feel maybe even unsafe even if we can logically see that it's not unsafe, uh, if that feeling comes up, we have to force ourselves to move into that space, let the brain pay attention to the action we're taking and see the evidence that that initial thought and feeling that came up is not relevant or helpful. And we have to do that over and over and over and over and over again until we condition the brain to stop sending up that signal. So if you're only doing the first step, understanding that theoretically, that's great. That can provide a space for you to start experimenting, but you've got to, you've got to start the experiment. You've got to give something to your brain for it to pay attention to, or it has no incentive to change. Yes. And everyone, that is what you're describing. The definition of sitting with the shit. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Literally right there. That's it folks. Yeah. It's our first, (laughs) it's our first podcast. Like, um, first podcast catchphrase sit in the shit what a lovely visual we can do something really we'll do some great merch just like something really really beautiful just evoke such lovely imagery <laughs> I um, the title of the podcast it's a bit of an eye-catching name <laughs> sit in the shit with Mia and holly fantastic welcome to 2024 <laughs> <laughs> I think we've spoken about a couple of them, but I think some other reasons that we sort of, there's just so many reasons that people could get stuck in this behavioral loop. But I think the first one very much being that they're attempting to show up for recovering in the same way they were showing up in their eating disorder with this seeking out as opposed to looking within. And recovery is a completely different game. It's kind of like, imagine if you were to to take the rules of one type of sport and then try to apply them to a different type of sport like I'm imagining someone showing up to a badminton game 
trying to apply netball rules. <laughs> <laughs> like, excuse me. I'd love to watch that personally. <laughs> and the side. It's just not going to work, right? Yeah. So I think um, another reason that we see this happening a lot or that could really understand it is that, like you were saying before, it is this huge piece of avoidance and whether that is conscious or unconscious, mm-hmm. um, it's because the avoidance is probably for, and this may not be relevant to everyone's experience, but it is sort of probably this fear of doing the harder thing because it is unknown and maybe that harder thing is actually being intimate with yourself and getting into conversation with yourself because that can feel really scary even before the hard part of trying to understand and navigate and shift and challenge the cognitive dissonance right even just the fear of what if I'm alone with myself because I think when that is being avoided huge stories are created right about huge fears of I'm not going to be okay being with myself but if you're not challenging that you are by default believing it because you're not giving yourself an opportunity to create evidence that it actually may not be true. You actually may be able to sit with yourself and be with your emotions and get to understand your mind in a safe way. Yes. Right? Yes. I think that fear, when I, you know, was coming up with some of those reasons, fear, even when I was exploring other reasons, it always came back to fear. People are clearly very often getting stuck in this loop, this loop, because they fear precisely what you're talking about. What is behind that door? If I really, I sometimes think that that's half of it is not even like the doing of the stuff that they fear and what is that going to lead to, but it's even just reckoning with, if I really look at what is behind there, what is that, what am I actually going to see? Yeah. And as you've said, like, this is something that shows up in life beyond just the recovery process and eating disorders. I've certainly gone through this. I really, I think procrastinated, on doing like deep trauma work until mm. uh oh, I've got to get used to saying last year early last year 2023 uh I really really procrastinated because I was terrified and I had all the theory I knew how EMDR worked I've been shown all like this is and I was like okay this looks crazy this looks like I'm get, going into a cult because they do this eye processing thing we have to follow their fingers and I watched all the YouTube videos I was like this looks really really frightening because I just cannot imagine that that's actually going to work And that's the second part to the fear, I think, is if I actually get into this process and I put in all this effort and all this time and I look at what's behind that door and I reckon with all of the experiences I've had and what I've gone through and how I've been treated and how I've then, you know, experienced this eating disorder and all of the horrible things that that has brought into my life what if it doesn't change? What if nothing changes? What if I look at all of this and do all this work and nothing changes? What if it's all pointless, right? Because I certainly had that feeling of like, I have to go in and process all of this stuff and jump back into these memories. And what if I walk out of that session and I am just literally, I've been asked to bungee jump and there's no rope attached to me. Like there's nothing to actually catch me when I come that close to what's at the bottom of all of this heavy, dark stuff. Yes. which is where that sense of that safe container that you're talking about. I'm not saying to people just go and rip off band-aids and explore wounds without any kind of guardrails there. Of course not. Uh, but if you do have the guardrails, not, mm. not expending time and energy. Uh, and I hate to use the word waste because mm. it's not, I'm not coming from the perspective of wasteful, but wasting your own opportunity to safely explore those things before you start burning out and going, this doesn't work. Recovery doesn't work. I'm not, I'm not actually getting anywhere or making any change. It's like, are you actually making the most of that safe container that you have to explore this stuff? Absolutely. And I think how you would have been feeling going like embarking on a lot of that trauma work is so completely valid. And I think that is probably a lot of people's experience coming to recovery or trying to try something but we can also see that you know it's very much stuck in that sort of like negative pessimistic view of what if what if nothing changes and then what we really like what recovery really invites you to do is to be able to shift that to what if it does yeah and what if you stop looking at the outcome and being like this is where I want to get to therefore if I'm not there I haven't failed or it wasn't worth my time or it was a waste but rather being like don't look at necessarily the idea the ideal outcome but the trajectory because even if you do that you do it for six months right 
I always think, and, and maybe it's not, you're not exactly where you wanted to be, but you're, you've, you've changed the trajectory, right? Like we're not flatlining anymore. We've got this like uphill trajectory and then we just need consistency and time and something will change. Because I always think imperfect action is so much better than sitting on your ass and doing nothing, yes. right? And there's so many blockages that stop people from embarking on this work. And I think the ideas of, oh, but what if it doesn't work? And what if I don't get to this point? are just so, so limiting because at the end of the day, you could try that, right? You could be like, okay, I tried this type of trauma therapy and I got something out of it, but it didn't really get me where I wanted to go. And I'm not super aligned with it. Cool. Now we know that that doesn't work. What's yes. next? Yeah. As opposed to like, there's all these op- options. So I'm going to do none of them. Mm. Mm. And I, it's the, we spend so much time in the, what if it doesn't work? We already know what that looks like. You've already, you've already spent a lot of time in your head going over and over and over and probably ruminating over like, what if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't work? And then you start to sit in this very narrow corridor of thinking, but because that's the only part of the thought spectrum you sit in, it starts to feel like the whole thought spectrum. Like that's the only thing that could happen. And part of the work that I do with clients is I'm not asking you to believe it. I'm not asking you or expecting you to say that anything else on that possibility spectrum is something that feels realistic or attainable for you right now. But I have to get you to start breaking out of that corridor because you're normalizing and naturalizing this very narrow possibility and it's starting to feel like the only one, right? So, and you, you actually taught me this, which is sometimes you'll get those messages or those dialogues from people who are like, I hate this, or this is the worst. And I feel terrible. And if we're just letting them stay in that, because that's true. And I want to hear that. I want to, I want to be the place where people can just honestly, and without hesitation, tell me what they're feeling through the recovery process. I'm here to affirm that all the way. I say to people all the time, if you hate this, tell me you hate it. You can send me an email saying me, I fucking hate this. and I'm angry at you for asking me to do this this week. Like I'm totally cool with you doing that. Something I learned from you was then, yep, affirm that, receive that allow hold space for that and then challenge them to put a but on the end with something Mm -hmm. that is true which is but I have evidence that I can do this but I have evidence that I have been able to make change even though it's felt terrible but I have evidence that this these terrible feelings do neutralize and go away the more I consistently try this so a big part of this is not is you know it's yes taking action it's also not allowing ourselves to sit in just the fear end of the spectrum or the what if this all goes terribly end of the spectrum. Yeah, because I think it's this really interesting thing happens in life, right? I think if if someone has gone through a lot in their life, they've got a a big trauma story and there's been a lot of hard things that have have happened, I think that can, can create this distrust with life and then that distrust with life can really um flood into a lot of fear-based decisions and by that happening it's actually kind of replaying these negative things happening because you're not trying to push yourself to do anything differently and it's totally true that luck and misfortune and randomness Mm -hmm. right play a part in all of our lives but it is also true that you influence the situation Mm -hmm. right so thinking of that information and speaking to this conversation around fear, the only real reasonable approach is to focus on the things that you actually can control, right? And try to create conditions to support yourself in doing that. Mm -hmm. So staying back and sitting in fear because you're too scared of what's going to happen. This is not creating conditions for success, Mm -hmm. right? Like how you choose to approach your life is your choice. What has happened to you in your life is not your choice. Yes. So sitting in that point of uh, um, what I choose to do is not my choice, then it's sort of like you're letting, letting your external world and your history and your experience dictate your current existence. Mm-hmm. And it actually is as simple as starting some of those mindset shifts of what if I can? What if actually everything does work out for me? Or what if when the next really hard thing happens in my life, I'm okay. Like it's going to be hard, but I have the skills and eventually I will get my feet firmly back on the ground. Mm. Yeah. I think it's this balance that is difficult to strike when it's like, you know, sometimes it's important to sit in those stages for a little, like we've talked about the roundabout before, right? Like sometimes you need a number of loops around the roundabout before you just can't look at the roundabout anymore. 
So forcing somebody off the roundabout before they've reached that point is probably not going to be very productive. But then do we just leave people on the roundabout? Do you know what I mean? Like, do we just like say to people, give yourself permission to stay on the roundabout until you get sick of it? Because they may never get sick of it. So it's a it's a difficult balance to strike. Yeah. But sometimes it is important to, it, this is where the self-awareness piece is so crucial. And it's a huge part of what we do as the mirror and, you know, having really direct and real conversations with people, which is that self-awareness piece of like, why am I still on the roundabout, right? Like what's, and, and it now that I have self-awareness, now that I have awareness that I am where I am and I'm not where I want to be and I can identify this gap, what are the reasons why I'm not taking those steps? Like I was saying before, even though your trauma and hurt and experience that has maybe fueled your current patterns is not your fault. The healing of these patterns can only be done by you. Yes. So people can certainly help you get off the roundabout, but it will be your intention and your effort that ultimately will help you evolve past the current hurt that you might be continuing to choose to carry on the roundabout completely and I also want to you know hold a bit of space for the fact that people have been so let down by treatment people have been so let down by treatment models and archaic uh, approaches that strip them of autonomy and strip them of any capacity Mm -hmm. to have that sense of I have some influence over this trajectory and what I'm going to do because the model of treatment that they've been in has been the antithesis of that. And I Mm. think that can be very jarring for people when they come into coaching and they hear from us, I can't drive to your house and make you do anything. I can give you some insights into why it's worth doing and what this could look like for you. And then I can give you some clear steps and frameworks and a safety net under you to be able to experiment, to get to those outcomes you want to get to. And they're like, you're not going to make me like, you're not going <laughs> to, you're yeah. not going to like threaten and, you know, um, uh, shame and guilt and like, you're not going to do, okay, well, and there can be a little bit of then discomfort with taking ownership of their recovery process. And that's a yeah. point yeah. of the recovery trajectory that I hope everyone can switch into, which is that this is your recovery. It is your life. It is for you and by you. It is with materials and tools that are maybe handed to you, but you've got the hammer and you've got the nail and that nail is not going into that wall unless you start hammering into it, right? It's kind of like if somebody gave, I sometimes explain it, like if somebody gave you a block of land, right? In the most beautiful place you can imagine, whatever that is for you, looking at the ocean or looking at a valley or looking at the mountains or whatever it might be. And they somebody showed up and said, here's all the materials to build a house and here's all the tools, but you have to build it, right? Mm. And the materials and the tools are nothing unless you actually start constructing it. And then once you've built it, you get to live there forever, but you can't live there on day one. There's no room for you to, you know, take shelter in. There's, you can't occupy it initially. And that's that action led thought, feeling followed aspect of like, no, you can't live there as soon as you start building it. But the only way it's ultimately going to get built is if you show up to that block of land every day and you pick up a tool and you do something. Yes, absolutely. And then I think it's so easy, particularly if you are coming from the experience where you feel like you have been really let down by different approaches to recovery or different practitioners or systems or whatever it might be. It's, I think it would be even easier to be like, cool, I'm on the plot of land. I'm starting to build the house day one. No, I want a faster house. Now, can I have a new yeah. one? I want a new plot of land and I want some different tools. Yeah. And do you have a like ready-made one? Do you have like, is there like a flat pack? Is it like the Ikea like- of, um, <laughs> of houses? <laughs> On Gumtree being like, okay, who's going to build my house? You just build it with an um, Allen key? <laughs> yeah, and I think if that has sort of been your experience. And, you know, it's so easy for us, for everyone. And I wanted this in recovery to be like, okay, I want a faster house. How am I going to do this? Cool. I'll just try like a new practitioner, a new approach. And I think yes. it's really important to ask yourself these questions. And, it's, it, and it differs for every person in every situation because there will be times where this practitioner actually isn't supporting your needs or this approach actually isn't working, but do I actually need to spend my time searching for better information or do I need to spend more time using the information I already have and actually acting on it? Right. If If I'm moving plots to build a new house, I still have no carpentry skills. I haven't got the skills. I'm just hoping that somewhere else it's going to be easier. And again, the carpentry skills, this is the inner work. You you need the foundations of the house before we're getting anywhere else, before you can even think about the decorations. 
Completely. If you speed run through the foundation and it cracks and you build your house, nice to live there for two years and then it's all going to sink into, you know, what's sitting underneath you. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> it's, I blame eating disorder, you know, promises for so much of this thinking. I think you were so right with what you were saying earlier. I think it's so influenced by like diet and wellness co- culture and hustle culture and, you know, um, capitalism for sure, where it's like, if I get all this stuff and I tick all these boxes, like that's enough and I'm done. And if that were the case, you would have people who from an objective standpoint, have all the things that everybody wants and they'd all be happy and at peace and self-actualized. And that's just not what we see, right? There's no speed running out of really reckoning with being a person or really reckoning with whatever your current challenge is, whether it's an eating disorder or it's something else, Mm -hmm. maladaptive coping mechanism, a traumatic event you've been through, whatever it might be. Like there's no cheat code or speed running around this stuff. Uh, And the urgency that I feel to help people recognize this stuff is because, like I said, if you're going to do this work, let's really get you to the outcomes you want to get to. If you're going to show up and put your time and energy and resources into this stuff, let's actually make sure that you get the outcome which matches that energy input, right? Not the veneer of it, not like the those great memes of like, this is what I ordered on Amazon and this is what I got, right? Like you're not, you see this beautiful ball gown online and then you order it and it's a piece of chill with like a bit of rope um, tied around it with like three diamantes glued onto it. Like let's actually get you the thing that you're putting the the effort in for. I once um, bought a beach towel on Amazon and I like bought it to go overseas and I thought it was like like a sheet one, like, you know, like the real big ones. Yeah. It was quite small. And for some reason I didn't open it until I was overseas and it was literally this, big like it was a face washer I was like this is not going to dry my body or even my face (laughs) it's like just sort of 20 more of them and stitch them together it can be a lovely craft project for you I think also just to state the obvious that is some I think it's so obvious it's actually neglected often is that you are going to be living with your mind and with your body for the rest of your life so surely there's some appeal in really learning how to work with yourself, not against yourself. And I think if you're always avoiding yourself in sense of like, I don't want to do this cognitive dissonance stuff. Like I don't want to really sit in the shit. You're like, you are your own best asset. It's like kind of as if you're avoiding a friend, but you're stuck with them all the time. Yeah, It's a bizarre concept if you think about it like this. Mm. Yeah. You might as well have the conversation and like, yeah. Come to- come to a point of some kind of change or realization so once if someone listening to this recognizes yeah this sounds a lot like me it sounds like something that a loop that I get stuck in Mm -hmm. sounds like me you know even thinking about embarking on recovery and maybe I'm now realizing there's not a lot of doing happening but there's a lot of like just stuff happening uh how would we help somebody to break out of this So I think if this feels like it's you, it's the perfect time to address this because it's 2024 and this will be the year that everyone is doing the real healing work. We're all sitting in the shit, right? Like busy work is a recovery 2024 out. Mm -hmm. Real work is a recovery 2024 in. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the first things you can do to help you really follow through on any of the goals and ideas that you have and things you want to achieve is having a tighter account- accountability structure. If you're really struggling to do this on your own, mm-hmm. outsource who is part of your mosaic, who is your professional and personal team that you could really ask for more support, which is literally the job of a coach. Mm-hmm. And like we were saying before, don't fear failing or not hitting the goal. Like imperfect action is always going to be better than no action. And yeah. I think like again, like you mentioned before, being really honest with yourself about your recovery and what you need. Because this is going, what you need is going to change and evolve over time because our needs change on a day-to-day basis, just like our food needs and our emotions, right? So sometimes I think we can be too hard on ourselves and criticize ourselves to an unuseful degree. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I also think we can be too easy on ourselves and we're letting our excuses run our lives. Mm -hmm. So being really honest with yourself, self which like which way are you kind of leaning to right now do you need to be firmer with yourself or maybe maybe you need to be more forgiving and then really bring yourself back to center and then my other point would be 
take the time to understand what are the skills that you need to learn to support you actually hitting your goals. Like, for example, say you had a goal of wanting to be less rigid with your meal plan. A skill to be cultivated there is your flexibility, right? Yeah. So you could like really have intentional focus on that area mm-hmm. so that you could be like, okay, so now I'm actually practicing the skill that I'm going to need in real time when I'm doing the work, which is going to move me forward towards my goals. And I think it's such an interesting time to do this podcast. I mean, we kind of chose it, so it's, it's not really interesting. It was very intentional. <laughs> but, but the I think podcast really- gods came down and <laughs> instructed us, this is what you shall do this week. I think there's a reason, reason that we all love planning at the beginning of the year because it does give this bit of a dopamine release because it's busy work, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, but if all those goals are not followed through, it's not real healing work. So perfect time to break out of the cycle, right? And I would say something that I find really easy to do and I've been doing with clients over this last week is not necessarily asking them, what are your 2020 goals? But, and not necessarily thinking about what do you want to achieve, but rather who do you want to become, right? Like how do you want to be spending your days? How do you want to feel? And then what daily decisions will actually help you achieve that version of yourself right Mm -hmm. so an example could be instead of I want to meet my meal plan it could be I want to feel freedom and trusting around food so obviously working towards hitting the meal plan is a step but it's not the first thing that we think about we're going to hit the meal plan because this is how you want to feel this is who you want to be so you can see how taking this approach it just gives you a bit of a different frame that is really coming from this inner work real work Place as opposed to just the external tick the boxes mm, the experience versus like the yeah just get it done just like cross it off it's yeah. like yeah in aid of what to what end like what's let's like stay anchored to the feeling and the experience that we want that to contribute towards right I I really have very I think you hit all the points um and the only thing that I would add is Yes, this is an important cycle to break out of if it is the only thing you're doing is the recovery busy work, but to really anchor back Mm -hmm. to something that we touched on at the start, which is that recovery busy work is not busy work if it's being done in conjunction with other things. All these things that we've mentioned are fantastic. Finding inspiration in other people's stories, finding diverse representations of recovery, uh, going and finding literature or books or activities which support the doing because the central stuff that we do with people as coaches is set weekly goals and find an approach that's going to help them make change and to get in and make the cognitive shifts shifts with dialogues. But what we also do is we round that out with all the other stuff too, like the recovery Mm -hmm. busy work. But in that context, it's not busy work. It's part of the mosaic of what moves this process forward. I say to people all the time, there is not one silver bullet when it comes to recovery. Just doing the food stuff is not going to do it. Just doing dialogues and shifting things cognitively is not going to do it. Just reaching out to me is not going to do it. Just distracting yourself when you're distressed is not going to do it. A lot of those things in combination and at different times in different combinations is as close to like superhuman superpower as you're going to get as far as getting yourself into the driver's seat of your own brain, which is something I hope for everyone in recovery or otherwise. I just think recovery is an avenue towards Uh, learning crucial skills that I wish everyone had the opportunity to learn because ultimately all this stuff we're talking about, whether it's in wellness culture or diet culture or hustle culture or some of these maladaptive coping mechanisms, I really believe that's what people are trying to do. They're trying to get into the driver's seat of their own brain, but they're doing it by climbing into the boot. Like it's, it feels like you're in the realm, but you're so far away from actually guiding and driving and directing your own life. Mm, I agree with this so much. I feel like we have had the most metaphor heavy. I know. <laughs> but it's fantastic. At one point, I think we linked four or five. Lots, lots of cars, lots of walking, lots of exercise. Um, it's like, I remember at the retreat when you said, if we could just do like a super smash cut of every single metaphor that we used, it would get ridiculous and comical because they it I mean there's a reason they're so powerful in recovery because Mm -hmm. I think it just helps people go oh now I know what you're talking about right like if we say busy work it's like what does that mean but Mm -hmm. it's just giving people a framework of again it's that holding up the mirror which can be really uncomfortable but as we've said many times on this podcast 
that's where the change happens, right? If you're yeah, yeah. uncomfortable enough that you know that you're making change, but not so uncomfortable that it's paralyzing, you are in the sweet spot. Yeah. And a lot of this stuff, the busy work conversation, it is really nuanced to your own unique experience. So I think like if you're particularly looking at your overall recovery goals, break them down and be like, am like, cause this one goal could be busy work or it also could be inner work depending on your execution and approach to it. So mm-hmm. really like sitting down and trying to figure out, okay, am I just doing these things? Cause it kind of looks to an external party. Maybe it's like a parent or a spouse or whatever that it looks like it's justifiable. And like, I'm doing the work or am I actually skipping this point of sitting with yourself in your darker moments? Yeah, completely. I think we've given people so much to think about. I'd really particularly to have feedback on this one, Uh, any questions people have, any insights they have, experiences of being in this uh, sort of loop or how they got themselves out of it. We always love to see uh, what you have to say in the comment sections. We appreciate it so much. We love that you've got us there for meal support and just Mm. to touch base and, and to be a little bit of like a recovery lifeline for you. It's a huge privilege and honor that you let us into your process in this way. Uh, And we're so excited for everything that we've got planned for the podcast for 2024. Oh, beautifully put. Thank you. Thank you. We will be back for another one very soon, guys. Uh, Take care. I'll see you soon, Holt.